going to talk about the invisible universe today. And like I said, I was actually trying to figure out what the invisible universe was because it sounds really good. And then you start thinking about all the different parts of it. And um, there's a lot of stuff that's difficult to see or impossible to see with our eyes and with our normal visible parts of the spectrum. So what I wanted to do is kind of talk a little bit about this in terms of what we can see and what we can't see, uh, both with our eyes and with telescopes, and kind of talk about the limitations of it. Um, so uh, I guess to, to start with, uh, I should just mention that there's actually the reason that I'm giving this talk on the Invisible Universe is last year we did an uh, audience preference one, uh, so we kind of came up with a survey. And this is one of these things that people wanted to do. They wanted to learn more about multi-wavelength astronomy and some things about dark matter. So that's kind of why, so I said, oh, yeah, I could do that. Um, so, uh, but also, I'm a professor here, by the way, in, in case you're wondering. So the, the first thing to talk about is just rainbows, because rainbows kind of really capture what we can see. The visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum is the, the thing we call visible light. And you know, it goes all the way through the different colors associated with this. We, we have you know, going red all the way through violet. And whenever you look up at a rainbow, it's kind of the light getting broken up into different parts. And the thing is, just this idea of the rainbow basically gets us at most of astronomy. Being able to break light down into different wavelengths gives us a huge amount of information about the universe. Uh, because light's composed of a variety of different frequencies. Uh, there's different frequencies, and with those frequencies, there's different wavelengths. And because there's different frequencies and wavelengths, we can actually take something like the white light coming from here or from a star and look at the individual components of the light and kind of break it down and, and see what's there by looking at the spectra. So with this, you know, there's particular frequencies, there's particular wavelengths with those frequencies. We measure how much is coming at each of these different wavelengths. And the spectrum we tell gives us a huge amount of information. So just as an example, we can find out the temperature of stars just by looking at the spectrum coming from stars. Uh, hotter stars are a little more bluish, cooler stars are more reddish. So we can look at that balance and we can also look at specific spectral lines that tell us also things about the composition and the temperature and also whether they're coming towards us or going away from us. So all of this is spectral analysis and the key idea is breaking light down to its components. Now you think about the components of light and you, you always come down to, well, the spectrum is roji biv, right? So it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Although if you pointed out indigo, I would probably not, I'd call it probably purple. So still, it's this range of different things, right? So that's a typical kinds of colors we talk about. And you know, the simplistic version of it is, is just this. These are the colors that we see, right? They're the basic colors we see. Now, of course, we see more than that. Um, what we're doing when we're seeing things with our eye is actually pretty complicated. We're actually taking individual wavelengths of light and then identifying something as a color. And there's a lot of psychology and also some physiology in this. It turns out that our eyes can detect three different bands of wavelengths and we, like, we look at the balance between these things. So the color that makes up a reddish color isn't just one thing. For us, red is a combination of things that makes it red. And even if you have the same color red, two different same color reds, you can actually make that in a couple different ways. Because our eyes look at the kind of combined things and hear everything all together. So this is the first thing is we can actually, you know, we can't just break it down to this. We've got to go more than this. And, and here's what you get. It's not just seven colors. You get a continuous set of colors. So this is actually the spectrum of the sun. And if you notice on the left side, we have reddish colors. On the right side, we have purplish colors. And there's, this, again, this continuous set of colors in this. Now, the other thing that you notice in the spectra, it doesn't look like you know, the previous one exactly, because there's lines in it. And these lines are called absorption lines. And they actually are, are formed in the cooler part of the Earth's atmosphere, sorry, the sun's atmosphere, just above the surface in the chromosphere. And what's happening is some of the light's actually getting absorbed and then re-emitted in different directions out of it. So by looking at those spectral lines, we can also tell a lot of things. We can, again, we can measure things like how fast uh, the sun's moving towards us or away from us, or other stars for that matter. Other stars do the same thing. Um, we can also measure something about the composition, and we can measure even the temperature just by looking at these spectral lines. So there's a huge amount of information that we get just by breaking this down. Now you might wonder how fine we can break this down, and the answer is, well, what kind of detector do you want to build? Um, we can easily do 3,000 different colors 
across this. 10,000 isn't unheard of, 20,000, 50,000, you can get up to that. So you can get this really, really uh, fine detail in the spectrum uh, just by having a big enough instrument. Now, the downside is you have to have a lot of light to do that because if every time you're breaking this up, you're spreading the colors out, so you have to have longer and longer detection, higher and higher sensitivity because when you spread it out more, you get more resolution, but you need more signal. So you've got to keep, you know, kind of find a mixture between those two. For the sun, it's pretty easy. Other stars, harder. So this is the essential thing, right? So we take white light in, and I can't use this because, um, let me go over here. White light in, it comes out, it gets broken up into these different colors, and basically this stuff over here is the same as this over here. So the question you immediately get to is, well, that's great, but why aren't there colors above and below? And why isn't there a more purpley purple than purple? And a more reddish red than red? And the answer is that there is something there. There is colors there. We just can't see it. The human eye is limited to what we can see. And we've kind of you know, evolved in a way that we actually see light that works really well from the star that we call the sun. Our star and our eyes are kind of matched together really nicely. So when we go outside, the light coming from the sun, most of the light coming from the sun is where our eyes are. So to kind of understand this a little bit, I'm going to use the analogy between sound and light. And, you know, they're not the same, but they're both waves. So we're going to start with that. So sound waves you're kind of used to. And you think about sound waves, you know, well, sound, sound has pitch to it. There's high pitch and low pitch. And sound has wavelengths on it. And if you think of like a guitar, there's, when you press down on a string, the pitch changes. So what you're doing is you're changing the pitch by changing the length of the string. When you shorten the string, it goes to a higher frequency or higher pitch. When you lengthen it, you take your finger off, it goes to a lower pitch. So this relationship between the pitch of sound and the length of your string is tied together. Um, this idea of sound waves, well, sound travels through air, right? And you, you don't hear sound in a vacuum. In a vacuum, nobody can hear you scream. It's true. We've done the experiment. I can't really talk about the details. OK, but, but still, it travels at the speed of sound, which is about 800 miles an hour, 750 miles an hour. So the speed of sound is pretty fast. Um, and it's based on the compression of air, so it, or compression of something. You know, mostly air is what we're used to. It can be other things as well, but compression of air, so compression waves. Uh, light travels through basically almost everything. It travels through a vacuum. It can travel through air, but it doesn't need air to travel. It actually, uh, the electricity and, and magnetism and, electro, and the electromagnetic spectrum kind of work together, and it propagates by itself. So you don't need anything to put light through. Um, it travels not at the speed of sound, but at the speed of light, right? Because, you know, it's light. That's how fast it travels. Um, and it is electricity and magnetism, so it's not compression waves. So think of those ideas, but let's think about the sound-light analogy just for a little bit. So if we take that, let's start with a piano, right? So when you think of a piano, you think again of the some keys have low pitch, some keys have high pitch. Well, the low pitch ones on the far left Piano. Yeah, far left, um, those are the low notes, right? So those, when you hit those, they have the low, boom, boom, you know, those kind of sounds. I should mention I'm not a musician, so it's very important to know that right now. So over here, these are the low pitch notes, and these are the high pitch notes. These are the ones with the shorter strings, and usually it's tighter as well sometimes, but shorter strings. And these are the ones with the longer strings. But, you know, the reason that we have a piano with 88 keys and that works pretty good for us, right? It's pretty low to pretty high pitch. High pitch, kind of annoyingly high, and kind of low pitch, pretty low. And that, again, works really well for us. So just imagine, though, that we made a bigger piano. So this is our normal piano, but what we're going to do is we're going to create a special piano for dogs. OK? The dog piano, I think is what it's called. So the, the dog piano is going to be over here. And this is very high pitch stuff that only dogs can hear. So dogs are going to hear only these special sounds. You know, okay, teenagers are going to get the first octave. And then dogs, and then special dogs, I suppose, will go over there. <laughs> so really high-pitched stuff is going to be on the far end. When you get the high, high, high C, that's going to be well beyond the range of human hearing. 
And we could actually extend the pan in the other direction and make it for whales. So we can have a really, really low pitch whales, right? So the low pitch piano be below what we can hear, but a whale would hear it just fine because their ears are different, they're in the water, they're using sonar and things like that. So it would work you know, really well for them. So that's the idea. So for us, in humans, the optical part of the spectrum is the stuff that we have right in the middle, the stuff that we can see with our eyes. But there is stuff both above and below what we can see with our eyes. And you know, for all practical purposes, this is the invisible parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So here's the idea that if you look at this in the center, this is a visible light. And then if you go past violet, we cleverly name it ultraviolet because it's beyond violet. When you go to red and you go below red, it goes to infrared, just below red. Um, these infrared and ultraviolet actually have been known for a while. Uh, Herschel back in the 1790s, 1800 or so, he actually detected infrared radiation. And the way he did that was he set up a little spectrum and he said, well, what's beyond the red? That's exactly the question he asked. And he put up a detector that could detect energy and he found out there was energy that was going into the detector. So we've known about this for a long time, and we can measure it with other things. We can't see it with our eyes, but we can measure it by looking at the energy that's produced there. And since then, of course, we've gotten a lot more sophisticated. We can do infrared detection. And we can also go all the way down to radio at the very, very longest wavelength at the far left part of the spectrum here. Longest wavelength, lowest frequency. This would be, again, just like a piano. These are the really low notes. Then infrared's a little bit higher. Visible's, you know, middle C. Ultraviolet. X-ray and gamma ray. Those are all part of the same thing. The only difference is, again, the frequencies and the wavelengths of, the, of these different parts of the spectrum. So here's a question. So which travels faster, gamma rays or visible light? Same. I think the same. That's crazy. Is that crazy? It's not crazy. You think it's not crazy? Can you travel through a vacuum? Through a vacuum. Yeah, gamma rays are light. So this is the same thing. All these things are part of the same thing, electromagnetic spectrum. So they all travel at the speed of light. So yeah, very good. Tried to fool you all. I, I was just, I tried to, it's what I do. I'm used to trying to fool my students. Sorry. So, so basically, they're all at the speed of light. Everything's at the speed of light. So you might wonder what the difference is. Well, okay, let's go back to our piano analogy. Everything travels at the speed of sound. That's sound. High C, middle C, they're all traveling at the same speed. The difference is the pitch and the wavelength. Those two things determine whether you have a high C or a middle C. And the same thing is true with light. The pitch, really the frequency, is determining whether it's gamma rays or visible light or infrared. And along with that, there's a wavelength. So let's do a quick uh, explanation. So this is what a wave looks like. Uh, you know, waves have peaks on them. They have troughs. Troughs are the down parts, peaks are the high parts. And the, the difference between one peak and the next peak we call a wavelength. So a wavelength is basically, you know, how far it is from one part of the wave to the next identical part of the wave. So it's a repeating pattern, so we see it over and over again. Now, waves also travel. They don't just sit on the television screen not moving. They actually move. So let's do that. So this is actually a nice little wave here. So we're going to just look at this peak right here. And I'm going to keep my finger right here. It's a trough. OK, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. So about two and a half or three seconds between the same pattern passing. So you could say that the frequency of this is about 20 waves per minute, more or less. About 20 waves per minute. And the wavelength is this much. So the wavelength is that, and it's about 20 waves per minute. So let's, this is traveling at a constant speed. So let's go to this one. This is going to travel at a constant speed, too. It's going to travel at the same speed. So in both of these are traveling at the same speed. But I'm going to just mark here. 1,001, 1,002, 1,001, 1,002, 1,001, 1,002. It's about one and a half seconds or so between the troughs, or one and a half seconds between the peaks. But that means that the frequency is a little bit higher here. 
This is more like 30 or 35 waves per second. Sorry, waves per minute, excuse me. 30 or 35 waves per minute. Which means that the frequency is higher, but the wavelength is smaller. The, the distance here, the wavelength is actually smaller. Frequency is higher, wavelength is smaller. So when we talk about wavelengths and, and, and frequencies, they kind of go the opposite ways. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. So when we go to this stuff, the radio, infrared, gamma ray and stuff, we're really looking at things in terms of different wavelengths and different frequencies. Radio has really long wavelengths. It has wavelengths that are actually, you know, our antennas. Antennas that we look at are, you know, big metal things, right? So when you look at an AM radio antenna, it's this big metal thing. Um, and, you know, normally you can actually pick up physically an antenna made by radio signals. Um, infrared, well, infrared's harder. Infrared is really short. It's too short to measure with a ruler. Uh, but it's a very small wavelength, but it's a little bit longer wavelength than light. Light is, yeah, sorry. It's longer than, longer than radio. Uh, shorter than radio, longer than light. So, okay, okay. yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's confusing, right? Because we're going from longest to shortest, so we're going, yeah, a little bit long, yeah. So, a little bit longer than visible light, a little bit shorter than radio, right in the middle. Ultraviolet is a little shorter than visible light. And, you know, the numbers you come up with visible light, just as a reference, are, are things like 500 nanometers. Okay, and nanometer is 10 to minus 9th, so it's tiny things, right? So it's like a millionth of a meter is what we're talking about for these wavelengths for visible light. Ultraviolet's less than that. When you get to X-rays, it's even less than that. And when you get to ultraviolet, or, or sorry, gamma ray, it's even less than that. So these are really short wavelength things. Uh, of course, we use all these technologies as, or use all of these as technologies in our everyday life. When you think about radio, you know, your car radio is obviously an example of that. Uh, when you t think about your cell phone, that's also a radio technology. Wi-Fi is a radio-based technology. Um, all of these radio signals we use, it's very common. Radio waves are everywhere. They're permeating around through the room right now. I don't see any cell phones up, and I was hoping to point one out. Okay, so that's uh, good for you. But still, <laughs> radio is everywhere. Infrared is... Uh, we use also, we use infrared technology. When you think about heat, most heat is, inf well, heat is infrared energy. Uh, and we also have remote controls for televisions that use infrared signals. Uh, we do that just so we don't have annoying flashes around the room. They're just, the reason that we use infrared remote controls is because we can't see them. Okay. I think the cat can. The cat's eyes are a little bit different. They can actually see the flashes a little bit more. Or it's possible my cat was just crazy. It's possible that's true, too. It's hard to say. Visible light, of course, we use that every day. Um, ultraviolet. Ultraviolet light uh, has an impact on a couple things. We use it for things like sterilization of medical equipment because uh, the shorter wavelength is good at killing bacteria. It's also good at killing our skin cells, right? So cancer, uh, ultraviolet radiation from the sun can actually cause things like skin cancer and sunburn and things like that as well. Um, X-rays, uh, X-rays are obviously what we're kind of used to, medical X-rays. Um, they're used all the time. Um, and then finally, gamma rays. Uh, gamma rays come naturally from nuclear reactions. Nuclear reactions cause gamma radiation. And we can measure this. We can actually uh, go in and take a look at this. And they also cause people to turn into large, incredible hulks, which is exciting. So yeah, it sounds funny until it happens. So I had a friend. Okay. <laughs> High frequency, short wavelength, blue and gamma rays, low frequency. So all these things kind of add together. This is kind of the, the things that we're talking about that go beyond the visible. So again, just to put this in, in terms of stars and our star, this is a 6,000 degree spectrum. This is what you get from the whole sun. The stuff we see from the sun is right at the peak. This is what we can actually see. This is what the sun is producing. By studying these other parts, down in the infrared and down in the radio and up in the ultraviolet, we can get different views of astronomical objects. Now, there are some problems with this and some difficulties with it. The first thing is our atmosphere pretty much only lets this through, the visible spectrum, a little bit beyond that, but pretty much just the visible spectrum, a little bit of infrared, a little bit of ultraviolet, and also radio. So the infrared 
we can't see. The stuff just beyond the, the, the spiral, that kind of pass about here, we can't see. X-rays, forget it. It's not going to make it through the Earth's atmosphere. Gamma rays, no way. And so we're limited to what we can see on Earth. So a lot of the things we need to do are going to space to set up our detection. Again, radio works out pretty well on Earth. Visible works pretty well on Earth, uh, aside from atmospheric you know, turbulence. But these other parts, we have to actually go in space to actually measure. So starting with this, this is actually a uh, next generation telescope. This is an, primarily an optical and near-infrared telescope. So this is uh, an example of what's coming up. This is going to be 2024. This is the extremely large telescope because it's extremely large. It's 40 meters across. So it's roughly 120 feet across the mirror. Put it in scale, these are cars. Okay, so this is coming up and this is, they've broken ground on this. There's a couple projects that are like this that are in the 20 and 30 meter class telescopes. The reason you want to go so big is you get really good resolution. They have some things on top of here that are going to adapt for the atmosphere. So as the atmosphere is kind of wavering around because of wind and convection currents and all these things, they're actually going to be able to compensate for that with this telescope. So that's pretty nifty. This is one of my favorite telescopes. And this is an infrared telescope. It's called SOFIA. And what you're looking at is a 747 with a hole in the side. The hole in the side is where the telescope is. So there's a telescope right inside of that. And the reason they do this is they have to fly it at 50,000 feet to get above the Earth's atmosphere so they can take the measurements with this. You can't use a mountain. You've got to go way above mountaintops to see it. So you have to go up to 50,000 feet with this. When they do that, they open up the top. They stick the telescope out of the side, literally, and actually start taking measurements. Um, this is a, a NASA experiment. It sounds like this would be horribly expensive, but it's actually considerably cheaper than putting a satellite up. So um, this is a second generation. The last generation of this used a C-130, uh, and it was getting pretty rickety. So they, they were able to upgrade and give it a much better instrument now. So, so again, this is the infrared. Again, we're getting the reason we're going up in the atmosphere is to get above the atmosphere, so we're not getting the atmosphere is not blocking the infrared radiation. Yeah, you know, the aerodynamics on this was not easy. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff with this. But actually, at the high altitudes that they're flying, the turbulence is not an issue. They're actually up in the stratosphere. So it's pretty much laminar flow over the, over the thing. So they actually don't have any real big issues with seeing. Um, the thing that I think is amazing is the fact you can put a hole like this in the side of an aircraft and it still flies, right? Yeah, it's not only depressurized, though, but just the structure on that, just the structural weakness on that. I think you, you know... I think it would be bad. I mean, I would not want to have this happen in a commercial air flight I was in. Although it has happened to a 747 coming to, into Hawaii one time. So, yeah. This is a next another next generation one. This is also an infrared telescope. This is a Webb Space Telescope, uh, James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. This is also coming on top, online about 2022, I think. So, again, it's almost there. The thing that you're looking at over here, this is actually a giant mirror. And this is a telescope, so the mirror goes through this, it goes up to here, and then it reflects back down again. So this is like every other telescope. Um, it's designed specifically for infrared astronomy. You might wonder what all this stuff is down here. Infrared astronomy is picking up heat. So it's really important that you don't do observations in the sunlight or near Earth. This whole shielding thing is to prevent radiation from either the sun or from Earth from heating up the telescope. And there's a multi-layer system that cools down. So sunlight hits that, and there's like five layers here that actually keep the heat from propagating its way into the telescope. So JWST is going to be awesome. Um, this is much larger than the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah? Uh, I don't, uh, it's NASA, but I'm not sure what the, who the contractor is. Um, I actually, yeah, I'm not sure right now. So, it's, it's publicly funded. Yeah, this is actually a NASA project. Will it actually function for visible light? No, it's just infrared, infrared detectors only. Um, yeah, because we have a really good telescope to work on the ground with optical light. So this is about a four meter telescope in space. Hubble Space Telescope was about 1.5 meters. 
So the light gathering area is hugely larger. Um, so, and also for things at the edge of the universe, this works a lot better than you know, getting in space and actually having the infrared, uh, infrared wavelengths works really well. This is a VLA, this is actually an older scope. This was built in the 1960s and finished in the 1970s. Uh, what you're looking at is a bunch of radio antennas, and I don't have a good scale here, but uh, these are about 150 feet high. So this is an entire valley in New Mexico filled with these antennas. Um, the antennas work together. You take the signals from all the different dishes and put them together, and what you get out of that is um, one signal, one picture of the radio sky. This is actually a really reliable instrument. It's been up, it came in about 3% under budget. It's, it's operating 24-7. And it's been operating 24-7 for 35 years. So this is an ongoing mission of still observing the sky with this. Um, this is a, an instrument called GALAX. This is looking at the ultraviolet sky. So again, pretty much normal telescope design. There's a mirror back here, a secondary mirror, you know, solar cells because it's a satellite. The detector's back here, the light comes in, comes back out, and it's meant for doing imaging in the ultraviolet. So this is for a galaxy exploring mission. Again, NASA, European Space Agency. So it's a combination of funding on both. Um, you might wonder, uh, let me talk about this one. Two more things and I'll go back to it. So this is a Chandra Observatory. This is an X-ray telescope. X-ray telescopes are really funky in the way that they're designed. They actually don't have lenses in the normal sense. They're not glass lenses. They have X-ray lenses. And the X-ray lens is actually a bunch of Mirror, they're kind of like mirrors that, that focus the light. They're these long, thin mirrors where the x-rays can kind of bounce off of them. And it comes to a focus back there. So x-rays come in over here, and then it focuses at the detector at the back. Again, this is actually a European Space Agency along with NASA. So this is a, a joint uh, European-American mission. And this is the Fermi, Fermi Gamma Ray Space, uh, gamma ray space Telescope. Uh, this is for gamma rays. Now, you might wonder how these things get funded. And this is actually kind of uh, an interesting point. Because whenever astronomers are really organized uh, on this, every 10 years we get together, so the last one was 2010, we set our priorities out for the next decade. And we look at the, the things that we really need to get funded if we're going to make progress in science. And this is not done by any space agency. This is done by astronomers. So we sit down and we say, OK. And the things we came up with at the top priority were the James Webb Space Telescope and the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope which is a NASA department, uh, sorry, NSF Department of Energy facility. Those are the big two. Ground-based astronomy, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, space astronomy, number one priority was the James Webb. Because that's what we need to do to do the next generation of science. Um, the other missions are lower priorities, but they're ranked. So that if there's cuts, we know which ones to cut, right? So if there's economic conditions that, that prevent us from doing some additional things, we can do that. So there's a kind of a priority ranking for these different projects. So what does it give you? So this is actually just showing the sun at a bunch of different wavelengths. All of these are different wavelengths things. They're using different spectra. But you're getting everything from movement in the photosphere to continuum light to different temperatures. So we're looking at gases at different temperatures. The sun's a good example of this. Uh, you can see that if you look at the, the 10 million Kelvin uh, stuff, you see the flare regions. If you go back down to the normal optical light here, you don't see that. We're seeing different things because we're seeing different wavelengths. Effectively, these are just not, cannot be seen without having the right type of telescope. I want to show this one. This is kind of neat because this is actually a pretty familiar galaxy. This is M33. And the bottom left corner image is from a normal ground-based optical telescope. A telescope, if you could look at this outside uh, in the fall, you could actually take a picture and, and look at the Andromeda galaxy. And you'd see something that looks vaguely like the bottom left thing. If you go to different wavelengths, you see different things. In the ultraviolet range, you see that, first of all, there's a lot of space. There's some very bright areas, but there's also very dark areas where there's not very much ultraviolet light. That's kind of indicating where star formation is going on. Infrared kind of is showing similar things to that. Microwave is doing that. And then the radio is basically showing this outer ring and leaving the part out empty. Because what you're seeing in the radio is, again, this ionized gas from star formation. X-ray is interesting. In the X-ray, you're seeing mostly the center of the galaxy. The center of the galaxy, the center of almost every galaxy, has a black hole in it. We're seeing X-rays from the center black hole. 
So we're seeing the X-rays coming from the center of the galaxy. There's also some supernova remnants and things around it as well. This is a good one as well. This is actually uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Again, optical, visible stars, infrared. This is the, the velocity field, the gas field, molecular gas, atomic gas, ionized gas. So one way is to think in terms of wavelengths. Another way is to think in terms of what we're actually seeing. By looking at the different wavelengths, we can determine is it hydrogen gas, is it molecular hydrogen gas, and break down where things are occurring in the observatory or in the, in the galaxy. And you can put them together and get a better understanding than you could with any single telescope. This is not a great picture here, but again, visible light, infrared, radio, and hot gas, the x-rays. The hot gas has little to do with the rest of the structure. The hot gas has to do with the, where the last supernovas went, where the really large, uh, if there's large black holes that are eating things. I like this one. This is a cartwheel galaxy. It's a colliding galaxy. The big difference, again, is in the x-rays. It's a little hard to see up at the top. Top left is the x-rays. Looks nothing like the rest of the galaxy. We're seeing the hot gas because there's lots of recent supernovas, both in here and also on that side. Go to, yeah, Crab Nebula. Um, just, again, more different wavelengths. I want to kind of skip ahead just a little bit here. This is showing ultraviolet gas and normal gas. The ultraviolet gas cho shows this glowing gas around the galaxy. There's stuff that's out here that we just can't see without looking at the ultraviolet. So there's things that we're picking up because we're using different wavelength telescopes. Are there any blue shifted red stars? Yes, in our galaxy. Yeah, definitely. It's way, red, blue, blue shifted is a velocity, red stars is a color. So you can it, you could have a, a, gal a red star coming towards us. This is uh, one of my favorites. This is Centaurus A, a visible light galaxy. But if you look at it in both radio and far infrared, it doesn't make any sense. The image you get in radio and infrared uh, and x-rays are completely different than the optical image. What's happening, again, is central black hole is actually throwing stuff out in different directions. When we pick up the far infrared and x-rays, we're picking up the stuff being ejected out of the center of the galaxy. And again, we're, we can confirm that by actually looking at the velocities and actually looking at what's happening. But the radio also shoots out even further than that. So we're seeing very different views of the universe by using different wavelengths. Uh, we would have never looked at this galaxy and thought that there was hot gas coming out of the top and bottom of it. Um, and that gives us a much better understanding of what's happening at the center of the galaxy. So to kind of take this to the next step, you know, it looks like we get a pretty clear view of what galaxies are made out of. And I just want to talk about this little star here, which is going to kind of orbit around the galaxy. So this is orbiting around the galaxy, and stars orbit around the center of galaxies. That's just following the path of a typical star. But by knowing how fast that star is traveling and how far it is away from the center of the galaxy, I can tell you the mass of that galaxy. So the basic idea is just by using gravity, by figuring out the orbit and figuring out the distance, I can tell you the mass of the galaxy. And we can do this, and it's a slightly you know, different thing. The speed of this orbit tells the mass within that circle. Okay? If I know how fast this is traveling and how far it is away from the center, I can tell you how much mass is causing that. Because we know orbits. We understand gravity pretty well. We can say, well, for things orbiting, uh, I know exactly uh, how fast this is going. I can measure things around this. And I can use any star that's in that same circular orbit and figure out what the mass is. And you can actually put this together and say, well, let's actually do a couple things. Let's use this circle. And this will tell the orbital speed versus orbital distance. We're going to kind of put this together. And then we'll use a bigger circle and measure the speed of that star. And then we'll do a bigger circle. And we keep putting things in the graph, right? And finally, we do a really big circle. And that gives us this nice graph of the orbital speed versus distance. And it basically is showing us how much mass there is in the galaxy. As you go further and further out, how much mass is there? 
Now, you look at this galaxy, and you start getting out to here. It starts looking like there's not a lot of stuff out here. You go further out there, there shouldn't be very much. You don't see any starlight. You look at infrared, there's not very much light there. Look at x-rays and, and radio. This is a pretty normal galaxy. There's not much stuff out here. But the weird thing is, it keeps orbiting really fast. So there has to be a lot of mass out there. So we have a weird thing going on where we're, we're getting this thing where we're getting a lot of mass in the outer part of the galaxy, but not very much of any type of electromagnetic energy. So we calculate the mass in each orbit. Again, we do these masses, put it all together. And then we can also directly measure how much stuff there is. We can measure the mass of stars. We can measure the mass of gases. We can measure the mass of atomic gas. We can measure the hot gas. We can measure dust. We put it all together. And let's just see. We can kind of cross-check ourselves, right? We can say, well, I'm going to look at everything that I can see at all possible wavelengths and compare it to what I know is there because of gravity. And the thing is, The result is that we have 3 to 10 times more mass in galaxies than we can see at any wavelength. Not stars, not dust, not gas. So we look at all wavelengths. We don't see any indication there's more mass out there. There's something there, but it's really invisible. It's not showing up in any wavelength. It gives off no electromagnetic energy. It's transparent. Light passes through it, so it's not blocking anything. And it's a lot of mass. It's three to 10 times more than all the other stuff we're seeing with our telescopes. So first of all, this is a completely crazy result. Got to admit that, right? Makes no sense. We must have done something wrong. So we're going to check it another way. And the way we're going to check that is by using gravity in a different way. Instead of doing orbits, OK, maybe we blew the orbital thing. That's fine. So go back and check it. And what we're going to use is something called gravitational lensing. And the idea is gravity bends light, first thing. So if this is a galaxy and this is a far thing, well beyond the galaxy and this Earth, the light from this thing is going to get bent because this galaxy has mass. Mass is going to cause gravity. Gravity bends light. So distant objects, we bend light. And the thing is, what we're going to see, if we measure how much bending there is, we can tell how much mass there is. But this, this is a real image here. This object, see these little squares here in the corner? That's actually one faraway galaxy that's been broken up into four images. We know it's one galaxy because the spectrum's the same. The distance to it is the same. And when one of these changes brightness, the other ones change brightness a day later. So it's the same galaxy. Okay. We can do this not only with individual galaxies, but clusters. If you look here, this long streaky thing, that's not a photo artifact. That's a gravitationally lens galaxy. There's something in the background. The gravity in the front foreground is bending the light. So you get these weird things. This guy is, again, a stretched out galaxy from far away that we're actually seeing. Again, we know it's far away. We look at the red shifts. We know it's from behind this cluster. This is my favorite. This is an actual image. Uh, this, is a this is one galaxy broken up into three separate images. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what to say about that. It's just really cool. <laughs> Aren't the two eyes, so to speak, the same star as well? No, they're not. This is actually uh, this is a small cluster at the center. Yeah. So. So we're actually seeing it broken up. This is actually foreground stuff, and this is background stuff. So all the yellow stuff is in the, in the front. And this is another great one. It's a four, galaxy, or four image system, uh, just right exactly around the galaxy. So we can, again, yeah, measure the masses this way. So we've measured it one way by orbits. We can check it with this. So this is a cross check. It's completely independent. No orbits, you know, because we can mess that up. And what we get is the same thing. So we know there's matter in galaxies that give off no electromagnetic radiation. We get the same result. 
There's three to 10 times more matter in galaxies than we can see at any wavelength. We know it's there because it exerts gravitational force, both through the lensing and just looking at orbits. We call it dark matter. And the reason we call it dark matter is it's dark. It's matter because it gives off gravity, but it's dark. It gives off no light. It reflects no light. It absorbs no light. It's perfectly transparent. So it's a truly invisible part of the universe. And again, three to 10 times more than the rest of the universe combined. Here's a photograph of it. <laughs> Dark matter matters. Yeah. So you might wonder, the question is, obviously, what is it? And we don't know. Active, ongoing research. We're making some progress. We can characterize it. We know where it is. We know how much there is. We know that the normal part of the universe is about 4% of the total mass. About 25% of the universe is made up of dark matter. And the rest of it's made of dark energy, which is a whole other talk. <laughs> so most of the universe is invisible. The stuff that we're used to, the atoms, the things that we can see are 4% of the total universe. 96% of the universe is invisible. So all the stuff, when you look up in the night sky, just realize you're not seeing the whole story. There's a lot of stuff there, and there's a lot more than meets the eye, and even more than meets the infrared telescope. So any questions? Yeah. So is it not just at a, like, an even lower or higher frequency than you can see? So the thing is, it should be interacting with light in some way. So even if it was truly transparent, you'd still, it still would say things. So any normal matter, unless, so the temperature of objects, okay, but the radiation coming from an object are usually related to the temperature of the object. So when you have something giving off x-rays, that's because it's a million degrees or 10 million degrees, okay? And if dark matter was hotter than that, it wouldn't stay around the galaxies. If it was colder than the stuff we're seeing with the infrared telescopes, the radio telescopes, you also, you'd have another problem. The problem you'd have would be it would be colder than the rest of the universe. The universe has a temperature of about 2.7 degrees. We'd see things that were a lot colder than that. We'd see it as blanks or, or holes. We don't see that. So it's, it's not ordinary matter. It's not something it, we're... You know, I think we're at the 99.9% .9 confidence level where there's something there, but it's not anything we're going to see with the telescope directly. We hope that maybe we'll see some kind of particle interactions that are, you know, happen very rarely that give off ultraviolet radiation. But so far, all the detection has been negative on it. So, yeah. I'm going to draw this out for you. Sure. I'm sitting on a couch facing north. The window is to the west. The sun's coming in from the south. Okay. I smack the couch and I see a cloud of dust in the sunbeam. Right. Now, normally, if I get up and I look around where I'm not looking through that sunbeam, I can't see that dust. Right. So why can this dark matter simply not be dust that we're just not seeing? So it's a great question. The answer is that if you look at the distribution of where the dark matter is, it would have to be between us and the center of galaxies. So. We can look through, we see it in our own galaxy. So we can look at individual stars, and if we could see, we should see absorption lines. We should see something blocking the light, and we don't. So we can do this pretty well by looking at also at galaxies. If you take a galaxy that's face on, you should see dark matter blocking some of the light from that galaxy. Well, if I'm in another galaxy looking at my galaxy through a telescope, I don't expect to see the dust coming off the couch in a sunbeam. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, so the, but we would see, you would see that with an infrared telescope though. Let me just say that. Because the dust would be heated up by the light around it. And with, if it was something like that, if it was something like scatter, scattering light, you would see the infrared signature of it. Because the infrared signature of, of stuff is actually pretty prominent. We see individual dust grains. So as an example, if it was something like dust grains, we see the individual dust grains uh, in our galaxy really easily, even though they're microscopic, because they have a temperature and they give off infrared energy. So microscopic things with a temperature around other stars, we definitely are able to see. 
Um, and you know, we can account for that pretty easily. So yeah, it's, it's not the dust, it's not dust. Um, and you know, we, we think the most likely thing is some kind of uh, particle that we haven't seen. So the question is, you know, we've done the Large, large Hadron Collider, is there something else we can use to search for it? And the answer is no. <laughs> so they keep running the whole Large Hadron Collider experiment looking for things. Dark matter is the part that we haven't found yet. How much mass is there to thought? I don't know. Because if thought is an energy, and we can measure it electromagnetically if we've got something wrapped around somebody's head. So, so when you actually go on the scale, do you notice any difference when you're thinking heavy thoughts versus... <laughs> Yeah, but maybe it's just that technical. But still, if it's the electromagnetic energy, then you detect it. So, yeah. You've got all your equations with, with gravity and mass and all that. What would it take to zero it out so that your equations that you currently have are wrong? Yeah. And that's you're zero it out so there is no matter out there. You just have the wrong equations. What yeah, that's a really good question. So the, the other possibility is we don't understand gravity at all. That's absolutely a possibility. Um, and the thing that we've come to, there's, there's reasons to think why that's not the case. And there are specific examples where you get two clusters of galaxies that go through each other. And if you look at two clusters of galaxies that have gone through each other, what happens is the galaxies pass through each other, but the hot gas lets, gets left in the middle. So you'd think, well, there's more mass in the middle because the hot gas is actually more mass than the rest of the galaxies in these clusters. So the thing you'd get is more gravitational stuff there than in the stuff that passed through. It turns out the dark matter is associated with the clusters, not the hot gas. So even after they pass through each other, most of the mass is left behind. There's still, it has to be something that didn't collide when the two things passed. So the, there's a thing called a bullet cluster that they've, they've checked on. And the bullet cluster kind of suggests it's it's pretty hard to explain it. I used to think that, the, that these alternative theories of gravity, modified Newtonian dynamics, and these other things were the answer. Uh, I'm more skeptical now. Uh, it's harder to explain some of the things that we're seeing, uh, especially with bullet cluster and a few other things. So it's, it might be some hybrid combination. The, the tests on gravity, especially at really large distances, are, are pretty crappy. So, yeah. so I'm, I remember reading um, a decade or so ago about yeah, WIMPs. Yeah, weakly interactive massive particles. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so WIMPs are, are, exam, are a possible example of what could be the dark matter. They could be some sort of exotic particle that we haven't found. The trouble is Large Hadron Collider has ruled out most of them. Most of the ideas we thought could be dark matter have been ruled out. So we're stuck with something we know that is there, but we can't find it. We've looked under the carpet, it's not there. Lift up the rugs. Checked under the couch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, and it's an ongoing effort. There's a lot of efforts to try and detect this. We have some pretty good understanding of, of things like how fast it's moving and what its masses could be. And there's ongoing efforts to look for this. We just haven't found it yet. Stay tuned. <laughs> haven't given up yet. We know that as an object approaches, theoretically, approaches the event horizon of the black hole, right. it appears to slow down until it freezes in time. Right. Until at some point in time, it actually passes beyond that event horizon. Okay. Okay, so we also have this concept that black holes and quasars are with one and the same. That the quasar is the energy black being, emitted, the, yeah, right. yeah. being emitted from the black hole through throwing off the energy. So what if we're actually seeing, instead of a constant rate of energy being put out from a quasar, what if we're seeing the light that is frozen at the surface of the event horizon? Well, it still only has a finite amount of mass, though. So the, the mass and energy, we know the equivalence between those two. And you just can't explain it with those things. Also, we're seeing it in our galaxy. And we don't have a quasar here. So there's dark matter in our galaxy. There is probably dark matter passing through our bodies right now. Okay, nobody freaked out. That's really well, good. What I'm sort of getting at is the quasar light, the, well, it's not really light, it's, it's gamma ray, radiation. Yeah. yeah, there's some light too, but, but if it's frozen, if we're seeing it frozen in time, and we, we measure it as saying this is putting out so much energy per second, yeah. it's not really putting it out per second because that second is frozen. 
Yeah, but it, the, 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 yeah, the equations energy. balance out though. So you don't you don't get something from nothing. You don't create extra energy out of it just because it's time slowing down. You get less energy coming out over the time period. So yeah, it, it doesn't. Yeah, we can talk later about this, but it's, yeah, it's not going to work. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm just just curious about well, sort of the dark matter. I wonder if maybe the fact that we can't see it, maybe it's kind of outside of our color spectrum, and then maybe the different color that we can't see with our human eye. I don't know if it, yeah. That, that route or anything. Well, certainly a different. It's different than we can see with any of our instruments. So going from the longest long radio wavelength to the shortest gamma ray. It's not giving off any energy. So it's not anything that's giving off electromagnetic radiation. There's just no indication that it is. So it doesn't seem to be something that we're limited to by observations. It seems to be something fundamentally invisible. Now, there are particles like that. The particle called a neutrino doesn't interact with electromagnetic radiation. It'll, it'll actually, neutrinos from the sun will pass right through the sun 99.999% of the time. We can detect them in the rare events when they actually interact with things. We know they're there because we can detect them. But most of the time, they just pass through matter. And they don't interact with electricity and magnetism. So um, basically, if you ram a photon and a dark matter particle together, they wouldn't ever, ever hit. So which brings us to the final thing of the talk. How many dark matter particles does it take to change a light bulb? This is an ill-posed question because dark matter does not interact electromagnetically. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Let's go out to the observatory.